Good morning, everyone. The airline industry has set itself an ambitious goal to cut greenhouse gas emissions to zero by 2050. To reach that target, everyone in the industry is going to have to come together, make big changes, and adopt new technologies. Some of them are still being developed. So, Gail, let's start with, uh, you know, we talk about the, the airline industry and, and its emissions, about 2.5 percent or so of the global carbon emissions come from airlines. Most of that, almost all of it, is jet fuel. You need fuel to power your planes. So how does Delta get to zero? So I think I'm stating the obvious when I say that we're a hard to decarbonize industry. Um, if we don't start now, we're not gonna get to our 2050 goal. And so we are accelerating our own path through two main pillars. The first is embedding sustainability in everything that we do. And so that's like t taking control of what we have control of today, whether it's converting our uh, ground service equipment to all electric or changing the way that we're flying to actually reduce the amount of fuel that we're using. That alone, when you look by 2035, we will have saved 1.1 billion gallons of fuel just by changing the way that we fly, um, which you, know, you have to control what you control. The second piece is really looking beyond that and saying, how do we eliminate the full climate impact of our flying? And that's through revolutionary aircraft and through the magic of sustainable aviation fuel um, because that's the, that's, I, I, we were talking earlier, that's the silver bullet that it almost has the trajectory to us. It's there. It's just not quite in our grasp to have the volume that we need. Um, but right now, we've, we found a lever as opposed to talking about creating something that's carbon neutral and investing in carbon credits. We're actually talking about decarbonization um, and having the ability to do so. Dr. Gruber, why don't you tell us about uh, sustainable aviation fuel, some people call it SAF. What is it and how does this help address carbon emission issues? Sure, so the first thing is that sustainable aviation fuel is just jet fuel, plain old jet fuel, except for we've changed the carbon source. Instead of having fossil-based carbon, it's renewable carbon. The way that that gets to be there is you start with CO2 in the atmosphere and you take advantage of photosynthesis, that means we're growing stuff, you capture it as carbohydrates, then you convert those carbohydrates into an alcohol, and then do simple chemistry, copying it directly out of the petrochemical industry, and make it into jet fuel. It's a, actually quite a simple process. It's proven. We've been selling this stuff for quite a few years now at small scale, and the challenge is to go make it big. There's a real important aspect, though. Whenever we start talking about the footprint of something, you have to account for everything, everything. Do you know how with the biggest impact in driving to a net zero fuel, which is what our focus is? It's re getting rid of fossil-based electricity. The EV guys and I are friends. Guess what? We need some hydrogen, so we're putting up a hydrogen plant. The hydrogen people are my friends. The whole problem is energy infrastructure and renewable energy infrastructure. How do we create it and build it? And then there's another big thing that's is here. And this is all about, we're going to grow stuff, we have to do it sustainably. This means taking on the big problems in agriculture and solving them and working constructively and making sure that farmers are rewarded for doing better practices. That's all part of what we're working on as we work with Delta. And now as we talk about um, moving an entire industry to a new kind of fuel, how do you do that? And doctor, how quickly can that happen? How quickly can the scale be there? So I'll start by saying, you know, as much of a competitive industry as we are, this is not a competition amongst carriers. This is all of us having to work together and being very vocal and, and bringing in the right coalitions and the right communication to make sure that everybody realizes, unlike a lot of entrepreneurial uh, uh, initiatives where people think, if I build it, will they come? We are very vocal. We're here. We're ready. Like, please build it for us. I mean, right now, there is enough sustainable aviation fuel to fly one day's worth of Delta Airlines flying from its 2019 schedule, and that's it. And nobody gets anything else. That's it. So I think, you know, we're partnering with GEVO, we're partnering with our other staff partners to say, we need to come together and bring awareness to this. We need policy change. We need investment in infrastructure. He's got the way to produce it, but we need, we, we actually need the facilities in which we can produce the SAF. Yeah, so the capital investment of this is quite large. Now, the end product is the same. It's jet fuel, except for it's had its carbon footprint eliminated. Think about that. It burns and it has a net zero footprint. 
across the whole of the life cycle. That means it's a liquid, it's captured carbon in a tank. That's pretty amazing. Guess what? A facility like ours, $850 million to build to make 60 million gallons. We have demand that's huge. Delta alone needs several plants to satisfy their need. That takes huge capital investment. All right, how do you pay for that capital investment? Especially when the value of carbon in this world is uncertain. That's a problem. On a cash cost basis, we can actually compete with petroleum already. On a cash cost basis, raw materials plus energy to manufacture a product. That's amazing unto itself. How do you pay back, though, the capital for that plant? That's why carbon value is so important, why policy is important. Solving greenhouse gas is a problem for all of us. It's a social problem, widely, and the politicians need to understand this. But you can't be picking winners and losers. You've got to let the market sort it out, and you've got to let the technologies work. And while that, that solution comes over many years likely, Delta is focusing today on how you reduce or get rid of single-use plastics. Do you want to talk about that effort a little bit, Gil? Absolutely. I, I mean, clearly 98% of our problem is coming out of the back of the plane. But that doesn't mean that there's not an opportunity for us to solve what's on the plane um, and what's around us. And especially, quite frankly, if we can't solve that, how are you going to trust that we're going to solve the other 98% of the problem, right? And so um, to date, we have eliminated 4.9 million pounds of single-use plastics on the plane. The next up, thank, thank you. Um, um, but it, it, there's still more to come, but we've got it measured down to the exact, like I know the, the, the plastic cups that are on the plane is another 7 million pounds of plastic. The water bottles are another 1.7 million pounds of plastic. Our partner is sitting right here at someone somewhere, Antonio and his team, I'm so proud of the story and his story, which he gets to tell, but because we changed out the amenity kits, we eliminated 90,000 pounds of plastic while contributing sustainably to the communities that he's serving and, and running. Um, and to put that in perspective, since I just said 4.9 million pounds and, and he's 90,000 pounds. 90,000 pounds. You look great for 90,000 pounds, by the well, way. 90,000 pounds is the equivalent of three Bombardier CRJ 200s. So it's not a small amount of plastic that we've been able to do just with the work that Antonio and his team has done for us. Antonio, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your efforts and someone somewhere? Of course. So first we transform materials that would have gone to waste into recycled threads. And those threads we work with indigenous artisans to transform them into fabrics. And then with those fabrics, we create products like apparel, homeware, accessories, or corporate merchandise. Uh, and we are actually the first Mexican manufacturing company to be climate neutral certified, which means that we measure all our emissions across all our chain. We reduce them to the maximum, and the small remaining, we inset in the same communities where we are working. Um, with this model, just last year, we made more than 10 million climate neutral and social impact positive products. You touched on this a little bit, but what's really interesting, I think, about your business model is how it has a direct impact in communities that are struggling to find ways to be economically viable. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Of course. So only in Mexico there are 12 million artisans and around Latin America there are 50 million. 90% of them are women and 70% of them live in poverty. And they are extremely talented but they just need the right opportunities to show their talents to the world. These communities are also the ones that will be the most affected by climate change so it's very important to work with them in any type of sustainability uh, program. And today we are very happy to announce for the first time that just with our partnership with Delta Airlines, we have already generated more than one million hours of work for vulnerable communities around Mexico. That's great. Congratulations on that. Now, you know, another part of this is the climate conscious traveler, the idea that you know, beyond flying, how do you be a good global citizen and practice sustainable tourism? And that's something uh, that the country of Rwanda has really put a lot of thought in. So we're going to go to the, the audience here. Claire Akamanzi, who runs Visit Rwanda, uh, is here with us as well. Uh, Claire, can you talk a little bit about your efforts to make tourism in Rwanda sustainable? 
Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, our sustainable tourism is based on two Cs. First, conservation, and secondly, communities. The first C about conservation, we started by making it a law that we have to conserve our national protected areas, including national parks. And then we put in place guidelines to support tourism or tourists that go into national parks on how they can behave to support conservation. As a result, we've seen tremendous conservation results. For example, gorillas, our well-known product. Many years ago, the IUC and the International Union for Conservation of Nature referred to mountain gorillas as critically endangered. Two years ago, they changed that to just endangered because of the results that we had put in place in conservation. And today, Ellen DeGeneres has put in place a campus that just does research on gorillas. Because of that and all the efforts that have been put in place, 26% was the growth of the population of gorillas when we did the last census about four years ago. So conservation is important. But in addition to mountain gorillas, we used to have a national park that had been encroached by communities. We reclaimed that national park. We reintroduced animals like lions and rhinos. And today, you don't have to travel to many countries to see both mountain gorillas and the big five. You can see all of that by traveling short distances within Rwanda, and that's also sustainable. The last example on conservation I want to give is also how we've reclaimed wetlands. Wetlands had been homes for people and so many dangerous um, repercussions. Today, we have some of the wetlands that have been reclaimed, and Nyandugu Eco Park is one of the most beautiful places you will visit when you come to Rwanda. So conservation is one of them. The second one is communities. We used to have poachers that would go into the national parks and become problems to animals. Today, those poachers are the guides when you visit national parks, and they're the rangers. The reason for that is that we recruited communities to be part of conservation. 10% of the money we make from tourism goes directly to communities so they can build hospitals, roads, whatever it is that they choose to do. As a result, and how we know we're making progress, is when communities become the number one custodians of conservation. Third. Do you have some advice, some tips for, for good global citizens who are looking how they can travel sustainably, how they can be good, sustainable tourists? Well, Chris, what I would tell uh, global citizen travelers, um, first of all, visit Rwanda. <laughs> <laughs> because you'll be visiting a destination of like-minded people that think sustainability is the most important thing to cater for. The second thing I would say is, before you go to a destination, try to do some research understand some of the practices that they have been put in place to support sustainability and support those choices. For example, if you do your research on Rwanda, you will discover that Rwanda does not accept plastic bags. If you travel with a plastic bag to Rwanda, you will not cross the airport with it. You will be expected to leave the plastic bag at the airport and buy a better bag. But if you do your homework and your research, you won't even come with that plastic bag to begin with. The second thing you learn if you do research about Rwanda is that every last Saturday of the month, we have something called Umuganda. Everybody leaves their home between 7 and 11 a.m. to go to the streets, clean the streets. That's why we have one of the cleanest cities in the world. We plant trees. We make sure that we look after our environment. And everybody, every citizen participates. It's called Umuganda. And if you travel to Rwanda around that time, make sure you participate in Umuganda as well. So the second thing is you know, make sure that you learn, do your research, and be part of those uh, practices. The last advice I'd give Chris is um, show that you care. Ask questions to the businesses that you go to. What are you doing to reduce your carbon emissions? What are you doing to source locally? How are you sourcing your materials that you're doing? Because if you ask businesses as a traveler who's going to spend their money and they need your money, they will know that you care. And if they know that you care, they will care even more. Thank you. Claire, thank you very much, and thank Chris, wait, I have one more one thing. thing. All right. If everybody packs five pounds lighter, that's 20 million gallons of fuel a year. So there you go. Every, every little bit helps. Every, pack, pack wisely. <laughs> well, Gail, Patrick, Antonio, thank you very much. Claire, thank you, and thanks for giving us a better understanding of how the airline industry and individual companies can work to meet their net zero goals. Thank you.